I was reading a story recently about this man who was normally one of these calm people, very patient, calm, cool, collected, and one day his friend came to visit him, walked in his office, and the guy was way out of character. He was like pacing back and forth, back and forth like a caged lion. And his friend said, are you okay? What's going on? And the guy said, well, the problem is this. I'm in a hurry and God isn't. <laughs> Have you ever been there? <laughs> You ever been in a hurry and God wasn't? Oh my goodness. That is one of the most frustrating and maddening things that I've experienced in life. And right now there are a lot of people who are in a hurry and they're waiting for God to show up in their life in some specific way that they really need and it just doesn't seem like it's happening. Like he's just not in any hurry at all. He's just kind of meandering along doing whatever God does. And it's like, well, but I I need his help because... You know, I want my spouse to start, start show, showing some interest in me, and I'm praying about that, and nothing seems to be happening. Or, I want a spouse, and nothing seems to be happening. Or, I want to start a family, and it seems like he doesn't really care about that. Or, I have this big financial need, and I can't figure it out on my own, and I'm praying and waiting and waiting and waiting, and it seems like God is doing nothing at all, and now I'm just sitting here, and I'm in a hurry, and God isn't. It's like, how do you handle that? Because it can be one of the most frustrating spiritual experiences of your life when you're in a hurry and God isn't. And here I am in this series that I've been doing this series now for weeks, and I keep showing you the exact same verse at the start every single Sunday, and it says, if you, Jesus, these are the words of Jesus, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, oh, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move. And nothing will be impossible to you. And so here I keep saying, this is what Jesus promised, this is Jesus, what Jesus promised, it's what he's promised, and some of you are like, the only word in that verse that stands out to me is this, nothing, because that's what it seems like God is doing, Nothing. And it's so frustrating. And sometimes you can feel like, what's wrong? Does, don't I matter to him? Don't I care? Doesn't he care about me? And so that's why uh, we've been, through this whole series we've been in for the last few weeks, going through the life of this man. It is the true story of, um, of George Mueller. And we have copies of his biography right on the back counter, and we've been giving them away since Christmas. That's when we started giving this book away. We had to order more because we've given away every copy we had. So they're back again. For those of you who have been, I know somebody requested one online, we're so glad to send you one. If you're watching online and you want one, just let us know, and we will send you one um, just, just as a gift to you. And for many of you have heard me talk about it, for those of you who haven't, especially watching online, George Mueller was a man who lived in the 1800s. Some of you are like, why do, why do we care about a guy who died 126 years ago? Why are you even talking about him? Because the life he lived was the life that, quite honestly, I hope to be able to live for the rest of my time. I, I want the life and faith that he had. He lived in Bristol, England at a time when there were orphans on the streets. More orphans were at age eight and under were in prison than were in orphanages because there were no government orphanages, very few orphanages orphanages in the country. So if you were a child and your parents died, you were thrown out on the streets or put into a work home or put into prison or you starved to death on the streets or you froze to death on the streets. And the Bible says, hey, if you're a follower of Jesus and it's your job to care for widows and orphans. And so George Mueller and his wife said, we gotta do something, started taking them into their house. And they, this is their actual house in, on Wilson Street. And they started opening up their house and they started filling the house, and then they got another house on Wilson Street, and then they filled that one, and they got another house on Wilson Street, and they filled that one, and before long, they had about 100 orphans living on this street, and and then they outgrew that, so then this is the very first building he built, the very first orphanage in Bristol, England. He built it, Um, and they could care for somewhere over 300 orphans at that time. It was the first of five buildings he would build, They could care for 1,700 orphans at a time, approximately. And they just kept taking in more and more and more orphans. And you think about all the expenses with every single orphan, feeding them all, clothing them all. You got people that had to take care of them and all their salaries had to be paid. You had people had to teach them. Every teacher's salary had to be paid. All the school supplies, all had to be paid. Massive expenses. When he only had the first orphan house, at one point, his monthly expenses were $50,000 a month. And the cool thing about George Mueller, and the amazing thing, is that he had no 
He wasn't wealthy. Whenever he had a financial need, he would bring it to God and ask God to help him meet the need, and God did. All those buildings, all of these kids, all provided by God in answer to prayer that George Mueller prayed. It's just an amazing thing. I don't have faith like that. But I really want faith like that. A faith that trusts God so big that no matter what needs emerge in my life, I'm able to connect with him and experience God doing things in my life that I can't do. So he learned it. So when he talks about waiting and what he learned about waiting, I'm going to listen. So we're in this series called Unshakable Faith. And one of the things you're going to have to have if you learn, if you want to have faith that cannot be shaken, no matter what you go through, is you've got to learn this. How do you keep your faith strong in those waiting times? When God asks you to wait, how do you keep your faith alive? So I want to ask you to open up your program, take out the notes you'll find inside. Again, welcome to those of you watching online. If you're watching on YouTube, you go to our website at penulechurchlife.com, you can grab these notes as well. So we're going to jump right into this today. Um, and these are, this, this series has been sequential. I, I, I just never do this, but I'm doing it in this. Each step, each week kind of builds on each other. And so here's a summary of what we've covered so far. It's on your notes, but um, not, and it's all filled in for you because we've covered these in, in past weeks. You have to start somewhere, somewhere. You gotta start small. You gotta start trusting God with something. And we've been saying, if you wanna experience God in this world, then you have to take some step of faith in your life. And we've been saying, what, do, what needs do you have in your life? What problems can't you solve on your own? What, what's really hurting you today? What's making you sad today? Think about that. That's often the place where he wants you to start trusting him. What are you worried about? What are you afraid of? What situations in your life are making you angry? And then we're, we've been challenging you over and over and over again to say, God, I'm going to start trusting you with what? And on the back of your, pro, your notes is an open section right there. And I've been asking every week, would you just pick something? You cannot experience God without faith. And you will never experience God unless you say to him, God, I'm going to start trusting you with something. If you don't trust him with anything, you'll never see him. You'll never see him in your life. You have to start trusting him with something and say, I'm going to start trusting you with this, God, whatever it is. It can be more than one thing. For I, I have more than one thing in my life that I'm trusting him with. So you start trusting him. Then we said, and here's what's going to happen next. The next thing is your faith is going to get tested. <laughs> the very next thing. Because the Bible promises this over and over again, your faith will have to be tested for it to grow, which means the needs will get bigger before they'll get smaller, and you'll experience delays, which will make you wait, by the way, right? And new demands, and new difficulties, and more dollars, and sometimes you encounter silence from heaven while you're waiting, and many times things get worse before they get better, and these are all tests, and you've got to pass the tests. And on the other side of passing the tef test, two things will happen. Your faith will grow like a muscle. You put, this, put more weight on it, it'll grow. And the other thing that will happen is you will encounter God. And that's what we want. We don't want... I, I don't want to stand here and just tell you what I, by my crazy work ethic, have created in this world. That's not what I want. I want to stand here and tell you what God did because I trusted him with the needs in my life and he showed up. That's what I want to tell you. And that's what I want all of you to be able to tell. Is how you met God. That's what I want. And those tests, when we face them, they reveal our, a lot about our character and our faith. They refine us and they make us grow. So you've got to pass those tests. And the way we pass the test is we pray without ceasing. So here's what I want you to picture. It's like we come to God, here's us, we have needs, and here's God in his infinite wisdom and resources and power, and the only way to connect with him is through faith, and the way you demonstrate your faith is by praying. Prayer is the way you show God I'm trusting in you. Mueller says this in his autobiography, prayer is the visible expression of my faith. So if you're saying, yep, I'm trusting God with this, then I'm going to say, well, great, tell me how much time you spent praying about that yesterday or the day before or the day before. And you go, well, I really didn't. Then I'm going to say, I'm not going to say anything, but I'm going to think, um, boy, then you probably don't really trust him because prayer is how you express faith. So if you're saying you trust him and you don't pray, you don't, you don't really trust him. 
Because if, if it is really God alone that you're trusting in, you will pray. And if it's not God alone, you won't pray. So prayer is how we express our faith in God. And then I tell myself the right stories, and we talked about this last week, and we use God's promises to help us tell the right story. And now into the one that I have <laughs> dreaded the most in the whole series, I have to keep waiting. And I've got to keep waiting for him. So this is the challenge. I gotta keep waiting. And I wanna start this part of it by asking a question, and you don't have to answer this out loud, just in, this is an inside the head question, okay? Are you a patient person? If you were giving yourself a grade, A through F, on how patient you are, what grade would you put down? <laughs> and would the person sitting next to you agree with your grade, right? So would the people in your life who know you best agree with your grade? So, so I, I, my wife thankfully isn't here right now. She'd be laughing so hard because um, she, I know that the grade that I would receive is F minus. So, and I don't disagree with that. I am literally so impatient that when it comes to filling my coffee thing in the morning, you know, you put water in your coffee pot and then pour it in, right? Do you know that if you pour it slow, it won't leak and run down the side? <laughs> but I have a towel. <laughs> and I'm not pouring it slow. I can't even pour slow. I don't even pour my coffee cup slow and sometimes pour it all over my mat on the floor and then I got to spend time wiping it up. If I had just slowed down, I wouldn't have to wipe it up, but that is me. There is, it's like slow, I don't have that gear. So, and then here's the next question that follows up for that. So, are you patient with God? Are you patient with God? Are you willing to continue to pray even when you can't see what God is doing? So, here's what you learn when you read the Bible and when you read Mueller's life faith is built in the waiting room. Oh boy. This is just not my strong suit. Faith is built in the waiting room. It's while we're waiting that we have these God experiences that we cannot have if we're not going to wait. When I was reading his biography, his, auto, his autobiography, over and over again, I kept coming across stories like this one. So, Mueller's at the point where he's ready to build this very first orphanage. And again, he, if you read his, bio, his story, he will not go into debt. None. He believes that if God wants him to do it, God will give him all the money to build a gigantic building debt-free. So he just starts praying about it. Well, God, if you want it done, you'll have to give me all the money. So all of a sudden, money starts coming in. And here's what he writes in one of his journal entries. It's now been 400 days since I have been waiting on God to, for help to build the orphan house. How many of you would pray about anything for 400 days? 400 days. He said, but as... As yet, God keeps me in this trial or this test of faith and patience. God seems to be saying to me, my hour has not yet come. So I'm quite sure, though, that he in his own time will give me everything I need concerning this work. How and when? I don't know. But I'm sure that God will help me in his own time and his own way. Is that what you'd be saying 400 days later? been praying about something for 400 days, it's still not done, and you'd be saying, I know he's doing it. He learned how to keep his faith strong in the middle of waiting time. As a matter of fact, when the building was being built and then he needed money to furnish it, he said the new orphan, later in his, in his autobiography, he said the new orphan house is now almost finished, and now I'm praying for the last amount to finish it. And a Christian came and gave me the equivalent of $200,000. That's a nice gift. And that's what he needed to furnish the whole building. He said, now I am able to meet all the expenses. He said, he had given me, God has given me the full answer to my thousands of prayers during these 1,195 days of waiting. Now, how many of you are willing to wait 1,195 days for anything, right? And, and yet... That's exactly what God made him do. And he knows, because if you read his journal, I mean, he's meticulous about dates and times and everything. I started praying on this day. So he knew exactly. So he just count back. It's like, oh, 1,195 days, God made me wait. How many of you would wait 1,195 days for anything? 
and yet waiting is built into the purposes of God. So it's what he learned. And again, you don't have to wait, right? You, you don't have to wait. I, I, I think the greatest regret, and I've said this before, I think my greatest regret in heaven will be how many times I missed out on seeing God do something miraculous in my life because I just wouldn't wait. A need came up, a problem came up, and I just solved it all myself. I never even thought to slow down and wait and keep trusting him. So how do you, how do you wait and keep your faith strong in those extended waiting times? Because that's a big test. So I'm going to give you three things I want you to learn to pray. These are the three things I'm praying right now in my time of waiting. So three things to pray, and I put them in this order. So here's the first one. So the first thing to pray is say, God, thank you that there is a purpose in the waiting. This is how I'm keeping my faith strong in the middle of my waiting time. Thank you that there's a purpose in the waiting. Because there is. And the Bible is full of stories of people who had to wait long, long times before God fulfilled his promise to them. So if you read your Bible, you'll see it. Waiting is built in. Moses waited 40 years, tending sheep for 40 years before God finally said, okay, now go back to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. 40 years. My goodness. Uh, but he, he wasn't alone. Joshua and Caleb, then as they were leading the Israelites with Moses, they had to wait 40 years to get into the promised land. 40 years. Abraham, God made a promise to Abraham and Sarah that, they would have a, that, they would be, that he would be the father of a great nation. They had no kids. And God said, I'm going to make you a dad. And then God fulfilled that promise 25 years later. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But when you read the Bible, you see these things over and over again. See, you get the clear message, right? God's time is not my time. God's timing and my timing do not line up very often. But it's, there's reason. There's always reason. So we may not always know it, but I've learned this. There are two major things that I've identified in my life. First off, there are internal reasons why he makes me wait. So I'm going to personalize. This is why God makes me wait. Sometimes in the waiting, my motives are revealed. And I don't always have the best motives. Sometimes it's just about me. That's not a good thing. Uh, sometimes he's making me wait because he cares about my character and he wants my patience to grow. Uh, we've said, I've said it many, many times. This world, this time you have on earth is all about your character development. The next one is all about your comfort. And as Americans, we've got that backwards. We think that this is all about our comfort. And it's not. It's about our character being developed. Because the only thing you're bringing with you to heaven is you. So he wants to use this time on earth to build our character. And so that means, you know, how do I, how, how do I learn to be born patient? <laughs> he puts me in spots where I have to wait. Okay. It's also about revealing what's in my character because some of you are waiting right now. So what's happening in your character? What's coming out of your mouth while you're waiting? Are you complaining? Are you really mad at God? What's coming out of you? Your character is revealed when God makes you wait. And again, character is really important to him. But sometimes there are external reasons too, and I'll give you an example of this later. Uh, sometimes he's making you wait, not because of anything going on inside of you. Something, sometimes it's because he's still preparing something that needs to be done. There's still some things that he needs to work out. Or the thing that you really think you want, that you think will be awesome for you, isn't awesome for you at all. And there's something better he has for you, but it's not, the opportunity isn't ready yet. And you may not know that for a very long time. But either way, there's always a purpose in the waiting. And so we go to God and we say, God, hey, thank you that there's a purpose in this waiting. And here's what I want to challenge you. You ask yourself the refining question while you're waiting. Since there's a purpose, and this is what I'm asking God all the time, and I'm sorry, that space is so small to write all of this in. But God, what would you like me to learn? That's the refining question. Since there's a purpose in this, then what do you want me to learn, God, while I'm waiting? What do you want me to learn while I'm waiting? And like I said, there's nothing I'm not doing that I'm talking about right now. So again, if you're watching online, you may not have known this, but at the start of this series, the matter of fact, the Tuesday before I started this series, I was uh, among the, a, a large group in my company that were, were laid off. So I've been practicing everything I've been talking about. 
trusting God with the need that I have, including everything about waiting. So I've been praying that first prayer, saying, God, thank you that there's a purpose in, in waiting because I still don't see where it's gonna, how this is going to go yet. I'm still in the middle of it all. And I'm literally saying to God, what do you want me to learn in the middle of this right now? And I learned something big. And it's more ac accurate to say that I was reminded of something really, really big for me in the middle of this. This is what God does. So in my waiting, God reminded me this week that what I want cannot become more important to me than God. Jesus is clear about what Christianity is all about. One thing. Do you know what the one thing is? What the primary thing is in your life? The number one thing, according to Jesus, is this. It is all about loving the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. In other words, the most important thing is that God is the center of my life and I'm growing in my love and my knowledge of him. That's it. And everything else comes below that. And what happens in those times of waiting where you have something that you really need is slowly and subtly this other thing that you begin to pray about, begin to pray about, moves up here and it grows in importance. And it can't. Because if you put something else in the number one spot in your life, then this whole thing breaks down. And you will not see God answering that prayer. Because in effect, you're, you're making this thing out to be your God because it's more important to you than God. And you can always tell when something's sliding into that spot uh, when you start to get angry that God hasn't given it to you yet. When you start getting really mad at God because he hasn't given you this or given you this or taken care of this yet, then that's often a subtle sign that something else has taken the spot that only God should be in. So what he reminded me of this week is I have to want God more than I want something from God. And that's the only way this works. Is that the order that you have in your life spiritually? You want him. And if it's a choice between, you know, me getting to know God more or me getting that perfect job, then I say, forget that. You're what I want. Is that the order that you have this in? Jesus said, you got to seek him first. And then those other things are added. So I, you know, I learned that in the, in the waiting time. If you're waiting today, ask the refining question and say, God, is there something you want me to learn while I'm waiting? Because who knows what he has for you to learn? The second thing I want you to pray when you're waiting is I want you to learn to pray and say, God, hey, thank you that you are working. Thank you that you're working. These are faith building elements to add to your prayer when you're waiting. Thank you that you're at work. So thank you that there's a purpose. You got me waiting for some reason. Thank you. And thank you that you're at work. And it's rooted in what Jesus said right here. Look at this. Jesus replied, my father is always working and so am I. So this is, he was, he was laying us into like pulling the curtain up so we could see spiritually what was going on. We can't see what God is doing. But Jesus said, my father is always doing something. And he said, and so am I. So God is always working. And what happens is the moment you start doing this, what I said earlier, you know, here's the infinite resources of God, here's us with our needs. The moment we start to trust in him and pray, then what happens at that moment of faith is that God starts working for you. Not like you're his boss. I'm not saying for you like you become his boss and he just has to do what you say. I'm not saying that. He starts working in the situations that you're trusting him for. Behind the scenes in ways you can't even see. So it's like when I start trusting him, God starts getting more involved in that area. And here's what Mueller talked about. He said, in, in, his, in his journal, he wrote this. He said, we don't have enough for today's expenses. And he, he didn't, hadn't built the big orphanage yet. He probably had, only had about 100 children and all the teachers and all the caretakers and all the expenses. He said, so I asked the Lord for help. And this morning's mail brought me $200 from this other community in England. And then he wrote, we now have enough for today. He's going to be right back in the same spot tomorrow, right? But he was so grateful that they had enough today. And he said, God's timing is always perfect. Why didn't the money come a few days sooner or later? Well, because the Lord, Lord, the Lord wanted to help us. So he influenced this donor just then, not sooner, not later, to send it. 
And surely all who know the Lord must see his hand in this work. And so he was saying, listen, here was this need. I was bringing it to God. And so as I was trusting and praying and waiting on God, God did the work that only he could do in the life of this person that Mueller didn't even know. See, this is what God can do that you and I, why we should always trust God and not try and fix it ourselves. How many of you have the ability to change the heart and mind of another human being? Right? Laughable. Can't do it. Some of you have tried with a three little word called nag, and it doesn't work, right? You have nagged, nagged, nagged. You're going to try and change their heart. You're going to change their mind. You make them, make them bitter. You make, make them angry, but you're not changing them. Not in any positive way. It doesn't work, but God can. So while Mueller was over here praying, saying, God, I'm trusting you, we, we don't have what we need for today. God was over here in advance of that, right? Because this, it, it arrived in the mail, working on this other person's heart, saying, you know, there's that orphanage. You heard about that orphanage? Boy, you should send him some money. You should send him some money. You should send him some money. And finally, he's like, man, honey, you know, I hear about this orphanage. I think it's cool. I think we should send him some money. It's like, well, I'm, honey, I'm going to be home late from work tonight because I'm going to the post office and I'm going to mail that orphanage some money, $200. Is that okay, honey? Are you okay with that? And he went to the post office and mailed it and it arrived at that time. That's what God is doing. So God will work if we trust him. And here's the principle, by the way, if you don't rely on him by faith, then you won't get to see that because he responds to faith. So if you're not going to trust him with the needs in your life, then you're not going to see his activity and work when he's capable of it and willing to do it. So are you trusting him? So thank God before you even see it because that's faith. So, hey, God, thank you that you're working in this situation because I'm bringing this need to you and you made a promise to me that if I trust you with these needs, you're going to be working. Don't know what it's going to look like. Don't know what you're going to do. But before I even see it, thank you. Hey, that's the second thing to pray. Now, the third one, I'm skipping letter C. We're going to just go to letter D. This is the big one. The third thing I really want you to pray is I want you to say, God, I can't wait to see how you bless me. And some of you, you're going to have a hard time writing those words down. You may write them down because they're on the screen, but it's not what you really think. You, don't, you, you really wonder if God actually wants to bless you. You may wonder if he actually wants to, to bless you. And so this, this just blew me away when I was reading it, okay? Over and over again, I read in, well, first off, let me show you what the Bible says about this. In, in, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait. And look at that last word, expectantly. If you have a pen and you're following along with that verse on your notes, underline or circle that last word in that verse, expectantly. So the, ex, the, the reality is what we should get to is to the point where I know that God is going to do something because he's working and I'm trusting him. So I can't wait to see what you do, God. I'm expecting to see God work. That's what the Bible talks about. That's what Jesus responded to was faith that had an expectation that it was going to work. And when I was reading Mueller's story over and over again, I kept coming across stories like this. Um, in, as he was getting closer to, actually, I think he'd already built the building by this point. He said, for many months, I've been assured that God in his own time would start giving larger sums of money for the work. Because up until this time, God had been taking care of him day by day by day. They needed something, God gave it to them that day, or maybe a little in advance. But he began to believe that God wanted to do even more than that. He said, at last, he said this, at last God answered my request, and I received the promise of a donation of 8,100 pounds, which if you put that into the conversion formula, it's $1.2 million. I don't know how many times you've been given $1.2 million in your life, but that's what God is capable of. And will. Would you consider yourself blessed if he did that? <laughs> You might consider yourself blessed. But here's what he said afterwards that blew me away. He said, he said, see how precious it is to wait on God. And those who do so are not disappointed. Your faith and your patience may be tried and tested, but in the end, those who honor him will not be put to shame. And then he said this, the size of the donation did not surprise me because I expect great things from God. Do you? When you're in this situation where you have a need and you've got your hand open to God and you're saying, I'm praying because I trust in you alone to tap into the infinite resources that you have because you're not only wise and powerful, but you care about me. 
and I'm just not going to let go. I'm going to keep praying and keep praying and keep praying because I expect great things from you. Is that your attitude? He went on and he said this, we must then continue in prayer until the blessing is given to us. We have to believe that God does hear and will answer our prayers. And then another quote that just, I underlined it. He said, Frank, frequently we fail in not continuing in prayer until the blessing is obtained. So he's saying this is what we do. We get tired of waiting. We say, I'm done praying. And the moment we are done praying, we break the connection. Faith is gone now. So we miss his blessing. Or he said the other problem, and this again, just really hit me hard. We don't expect God's blessing. We don't expect God to bless us. And then later in the journal, he wrote this. Work as if everything depended on your diligence and trust in the blessing of the Lord to bring success. The blessing of the Lord, however, should not, be merely, should not merely be sought in prayer. It should also be expected. And the phrase blessing really got to me. Because he's very specific about that word, and he uses it over and over again. You know what George Mueller expected? He expected God to bless him. My question, of course, is, do you expect God to bless you? Here's what I think this means. Okay, so questioning, do you, uh, more refined, do you expect anything from God? The truth is, some of you, this is your honest answer. Nope. I'm on my own. It's why you don't pray. If you don't pray, this is your answer. (laughs) Because you just think it's up to you. And you don't pray. You're not trusting in God alone. And honestly, that's where many, many Christians live. Nope, I'm on my own. They don't expect anything from God. Some Christians get to the point where some, they expect a little bit. You know, God will do a little something in my life once in a while. And that's honest. That's where some, spiritually, maybe that's where you're at today. You expect a little bit. He'll do something nice once in a while, but it'll be kind of random, not very often. Some of you expect that, you know, if you have a need, you can bring it to him, and he'll meet that need. You know, you need a nickel, he'll give you a nickel. But the Bible, and what what Mueller came to experience and express to all of us followers of Jesus, and what Jesus seemed to communicate, and what the New Testament communicates is, he doesn't just want it to be just enough. He wants to bless us. He wants it to be more than just enough. What if that's true? As I was sitting thinking about this this week, I came across a story that I had forgotten about that I actually told in a sermon once. It was about this young couple they met in college and they fell in love and they got married. And then they gra- he graduated, Steve, the husband, graduated from college and they were strong Christians and they're like, God, we really want to do this well. We want to find where you want us to go. Where do you want us to go? started applying at all these jobs, got some offers back, and they prayed about it, saying, God, which one do you want us to select? And they really felt like God wanted them to select this one in this small little town in North Carolina. So they said yes, and they packed up their their small belongings, you know, they're just getting started, moved to North Carolina, and they were setting up living in this small little apartment just a few blocks away from where he was going to be working. And so one morning he got up early, he was unpacking stuff, and he decided, you know, I'll just walk over to my, my office where I'm going to be and meet, talk to my new boss. And so he walked over there that morning, excited, walked in, and the man who was going to be his new boss greeted him and said, you know, Steve, I've been thinking about it. I, I don't think this is such a good idea after all, and I've changed my mind. And he held out his hand and he said, good luck to you, son and withdrew the offer. Can you, how would you feel? How would you feel about God? <laughs> so he goes back, and he's just, you know, dazed by this. He goes back and tells his wife. She bursts into tears, and she's mad at God. Because she says to God, we prayed, and we even fasted and prayed. We wanted nothing more than to do what you wanted us to do. We prayed about this. This is where we felt like you wanted us to go. Now here we sit in a new city with all this debt from school. We have no jobs and no future. And she said, I felt like God left us high and dry. Do you think she felt like uh, he wanted to bless them in that moment? 
for some of you, this is really important because it's how you feel right now. You, you had the rug pulled out from under you. You had something surprising happen to you. You have a need that you just can't figure out on your own and you've tried. And you're really wondering what God is up to. Here's what he's up to. She said three months after that news that his job was gone, a position opened up that had not been available when we first started looking. She said, if you had had us sit down together as a couple and say, write up your dream job, everything you could ever hope for in a job, she said, if you had had us write that up in advance, the job that he ended up getting would have exceeded it all by far. And then she wrote these words. Sometimes God doesn't meet our expectations because he wants to exceed them. Do you believe that? Do you believe that once you become a son or daughter, that this father loves you so much that he doesn't want you just to get by, but he wants to exceed even your expectations? That he wants to bless you? Do you believe that? I love how Paul wrote it in what he said in Ephesians 3, he said, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, all of it, immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory. What if that's what he wants to do? More than what we can even think. So here's some, some questions I want you to think about as we finish today. I hope by now in this series you've got this one solved, Right? What problem or need or issue are you going to start trusting God with today? God, I am going to start trusting you with what? None of this will matter if you don't pick a few things, one thing for sure, and say, I'm going to start trusting you with this. If you don't start with something, this will all be ideas, and you're, you will never experience God. Never. You have to trust him with something. And then add these three prayers to your waiting time. God, I know that, thank you that there's a purpose in this. And thank you that you're working, because he's working. Remember, the moment you do this, the moment you bring your need to him and say, I am going to pray about this without ceasing, because I need you alone. And the moment you start praying, he starts working. Prayer's the key to this. So thank you that you're working. He can't lie to you. And thank you that you want to bless me. And then you've really got to come to grips with this. Do I actually believe that he wants to bless me? You've got to come to grips with that on your own. Let me have you bow your heads as we finish up today. You know, I'm a, I'm a flawed dad. I've got a bunch of kids. I love them completely, regardless of, regardless of decisions they've made in their lives. I love them. When they're in, in need, as a, as a dad, I want to meet their needs. I want to help in any way I can in a way that's really constructive in their lives. And I'm a flawed dad. If you, will let, if you will let God do this, he will adopt you into his family and you will become his son or daughter and he will exceed what I would ever be able to do as a flawed dad. And he will love you. And he will want to show his love to you by meeting your needs. And the key to all of this is Jesus. The only way that we can be a part of the family of God is through his son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth 2,000 years ago to die on the cross for all of us. Jesus Christ gave his life for us on a cross. And if you will let Jesus Christ forgive you, then he will put you in his family forever. And then the promises made in the, New Test in the, in the Bible become yours because they are promised to all of his children. And if this is what you want today, you've got to give up any idea that you can ever earn it or that we will ever deserve it and just ask for it. And then we get it. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, say something like this. Say, Jesus, I'm turning to, 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 to you today. I need you to forgive me. And I want to be a part of your family today. Please adopt me as your child. Give me your gift of forgiveness and eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to thank you so much for taking time to watch this service with us today. And I, 
I can't emphasize enough that if you are watching online, if you want more information, you can go to our pe website at penielchurchlife.com on your phone or your computer, and it says, I said yes to Jesus. So if you prayed and made that decision to ask Jesus to forgive you, please let us know. We'll send you some things in the mail just as follow-up. Or maybe you have something you want us to pray about. And again, in the upper right-hand corner, it says, it says please pray for me. It's also how you communicate with us as a church. So if you're ever listening to one of these messages, watching one of these messages, and you hear us talk about a resource that we offer for free to the people who attend here, and you want a copy of that, please just send us a note. Give us your address. We will take care of the expense of sending this to you. It's just our way of saying thank you so much for, for watching. And if we can help you grow spiritually, we really want to do it. So again, thanks for taking time out of your, your busy schedule to watch this service today.